be so with, to the, Hampton to Newsom uh, is, is with us this evening, and he um, he holds degrees from Duke University, uh, the University of Virginia School of Architecture, and the University of Virginia School of Law. He lives in Charlottesville, Virginia, and he is the author of uh, several Civil War books. Uh, the one he'll be speaking about this evening, Fight for the Old North State. If you haven't read it, you should. Uh, quite honestly, and I would say this whether he was standing there or not, one of the best Civil War books I've read in, in a few years. Um, very, very good book. Um, and if you don't have a copy, they have them for sale here, and I'm sure he'll be happy to sign it for you. And I also have here a copy of his most recent book, Getting First Southern Front, Opportunity and Failure at Richmond. And from what I understand, this one's going quite well as well. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him. And it should be in right? Okay, all right. Well, thanks so much for coming. Um, you know, there are a lot of different things you can do on Friday night, so I appreciate that you decided to uh, come here instead of other activities. Um, and uh, I, I'm really happy to be here. Um, my, uh, I, I grew up in Richmond, but my mother and father from Eastern North Carolina, from Tarboro to Husky, and um, this project, I really enjoyed it because um, I got to spend a lot of time down here and learn more um, about North Carolina, you know, this, this book. Um, so, so what, what I'm gonna do is, we're gonna talk about the Battle of Plymouth but and we'll talk some of the details of Battle of Plymouth, but we're, I'm going to try to put the Battle of Plymouth in the kind of broader scope, um, particularly in the scope of what was really a kind of connected campaign in 1864 um, by the Confederates to take back some um, locations in eastern North Carolina that had been captured earlier in the war, and um, and also also kind of in the broader scope of like what's going on in eastern North Carolina you know during the uh, you know the Civil War in general but so we'll we'll go through some broad themes and then we'll get into some nitty-gritty and I will try to we were talking about you know what's the good what's the best time you know how, how long should a talk be at dinner we we're talking about that and uh, there's some definite opinions on it, and I share them. <laughs> so if you, uh, you know, if, if someone just like nods off intentionally in front of me, that signals to me that like, look, let's wrap this up. That is fine with me. But I will try to keep myself under control and and get through this. So, um, all right. So the so what we're talking about there, there are all these events that people hear about. Um, the New Vernon, we're going to cover them in different levels of detail. Um, the uh, New Vernon Expedition uh, in 1864, which is something not a lot of people um, know a whole lot about. We'll talk a little bit about the Kenson hangings, a little bit about the gubernatorial election in 1864, um, talk about the ironclads, of course. Um, and then the, uh, the Battle of Plymouth, the uh, capture of Washington, and then a second attack on New Bern. And all of these, some of these things we'll just talk about for a second. But so I imagine people have heard about most or all of these events. But um, <coughs> the point, one of the main points I want to make is th these are all part of a connected campaign that was planned in early 1864 by the Confederate High Command to retake key positions in the state. And when I was looking at this as a kind of book project, I realized that it made a, you know interesting story. And I think it, um, you know, I, I thought it would make an interesting book that all kind of held together. Um, so also in the broader context, talk a little bit about um, Social conditions in the state, just briefly. Um, obviously, the Confederate goals, some of the political tensions, and um, you know the implications of these events in 1864 for the wider scope of the war. So, in the and then let's move the slides. Oh, how about this? There you go. Okay. 
Okay. There you go. All right. Um, and my slide management is horrible. So if I'm talking about the Battle of Plymouth and there's something up there about New Bern, say, hey, Hampton, let's move this <laughs> on. Um, yeah, it, that, that would be great. Yeah. Um, all right, so in the early months of 1864, you've got um, the Confederate leaders, they, um, they develop this plan, and it's the brainchild of Robert E. Lee, and on January 2nd, 1864, really cold day uh, up in Virginia, Lee is at his headquarters, and he's, you know, you look at like the OR, or the dispatches, and you know, there's all there are all these things coming out of headquarters. But one of this is this note to Jefferson Davis proposing an attack on the Union forces in North Carolina. And Lee says the time is at hand when, if an attempt can be made to capture the enemy forces at Newburgh, it should be done. And Davis embraces this proposal, and by the end of the month, you've got a very strong Confederate column marching to the, uh, the gates of New Bern on the, uh, on the Neuse River. So, so let's back up a little bit and talk about what led to this. Um, you know, what led to this decision? And to, to uh, first, let's go back a little bit to um, 1862. Like, what, what, is happening, what is happening throughout the war in Eastern North Carolina that leads Lee to make this decision? And um, early in the war, Union forces captured much of coastal North Carolina, as many of you know. Um, and of course, under Ambrose Burnside, um, it takes key positions at uh, Roanoke Island, New Bern, uh, Beaufort, Fort Macon, and uh, essentially, uh, they you know they they quickly um, convert many of these locations not all at once, but locations to strong uh, positions that are held by U.S. troops. Um, they do eventually set up um, outposts at Plymouth and at Washington, um, but the main base is here at New Bern, and you can see New Bern, see this little railroad here? New Bern's kind of a key position because it's right on the railroad that's heading into the interior here. Uh, so. One of the reasons that they're able to do this is because of the naval superiority that the U.S. forces have pretty much everywhere, and also, you know, in um, in the waters of North Carolina. And the uh, this allows this this naval control allows them to set up these different positions and kind of project power into the uh, areas around these positions. And part of the important, they, they not only hinder Confederate military operations, but they also make it difficult for Confederate uh, commissary to gather supplies and bring food up to Lee's army in Virginia and forces elsewhere from these agriculturally rich regions in Eastern North Carolina. The Confederates also, they, they, you know, they understood the, what was uh, lined up against them with the naval issues, and they had a very able um, uh, Secretary of the Navy, Stephen Mallory, there he is on the bottom. He was a Florida senator before the war, and he had a lot of experience in naval affairs. And Mallory, he, he kind of develops this three-pronged strategy in order to try to partially counter the advantage that the um, that the U.S. Navy has, and one is the uh, focus. I mean, so it's kind of three things that he focuses on. One is commerce rating, um, like the CSS Alabama, that's kind of famous. Another is um, deploying high-velocity rifle cannon on the few ships and boats the Confederacy has, and also to the extent that they can in the coastal forts. And then also <coughs> the construction and deployment of powerful ironclads which is um, uh, you know an, an important aspect of that and so in North Carolina there are several of these ironclad projects early in the war um, and there are several that start off at Elizabeth City and with Burnside's victories early in the war those were kind of shifted inland more and so by 1863 kind of um, you've got one 
near Halifax in a cornfield on the Roanoke River. That becomes the Albemarle eventually. You have one at Tarboro, and that um, actually gets burned during Potter's Raid a couple weeks after Gettysburg. And then you've got, of course, the one that's a couple feet over there. Um, all right, so that's the, that's the naval stuff. And um, so what's the overall importance of this? I, I kind of alluded to it with the railroad and stuff, but the, uh, the, the Union forces that, you know, they look to benefit from their presence. They use Eastern North Carolina as a, um, as kind of a recruiting station for both white and black regiments throughout the war. Um, and they, oops, it's working. Um, they have this, um, they, so they have this position here, and as one historian said, they have this position that's kind of poised like a dagger into the interior of the state. And the really important thing is it's, po it's poised right, you know, to go right after this line here. And this is the, the um, Wilmington Wil 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 Railroad, right? And this is a key lifeline because it connects Wilmington to these forces <laughs> up there, and the Federals are right, right here, you know? And the interesting thing is that they never really take advantage of this position. Now, Foster, John Foster, conducts a raid um, on Kinston in 1862, and there are large, some large raids and a never-ending string of small operations in eastern North Carolina in 1862 and 1863. If you look through the OR, it's amazing. The, the official records that kind of catalog all the operations. It's amazing all the things that are going on in Eastern North Carolina, but never any real big thrust to, to create a permanent lodgement at Goldsboro and really take advantage of this position. And there are different, we were talking about this at dinner, different reasons for it. I think this would be like a great thing for somebody to write about, and apparently somebody has. Uh, in a master's thesis, but the, but the, the, it seemed that there were always priorities in Virginia, um, priorities in South Carolina. Charleston was a huge focus for the Union High Command, and there was never really a concerted, at least into through 1864, a concerted effort to take advantage of this lodgment here. So that's kind of some of the military uh, implications of this. Um, of, of the, you know, the, this present union presence in eastern North Carolina. There are also social changes. Um, the union oc occupation brought immense cha changes and important impacts throughout the population. Uh, there's, you know, schism between uh, white civilians, those who supported the Confederates, and the fairly strong um, white unionist sentiment in um, in North Carolina, but I think generally it's safe to say that you know these changes affected enslaved people the most, um, and they began to free themselves almost immediately after the Federals uh, took control of the bases in, uh, in Eastern North Carolina, and they escaped. They went to the bases. They they were very proactive, and many of many of the enslaved people very proactive in gaining their own freedom. And they were seeking to improve their lives. They were seeking to destroy slavery, and they were seeking to aid the United States in the war. And they would go to these uh, bases, um, and and they would work as laborers. And many of them would uh, enlist into units that were eventually um, well, folded into the uh, the Union Army. Now, interesting. None of the, as far as I know, none of the units. The black units raised in North Carolina actually fought in North Carolina, operated here. They they went to other other places. Um, so that's the the kind of social issue, and, and and that's kind of the back backdrop. This is what's going on. Like so, Lee Lee writes this letter to Davis, says, "Let's go after New Bern." This is early 1864, and um, and what he's looking at is. He's doing this in the backdrop of this union uh, control over these key spots in the state, and he's looking to get something done. Now, so what are his objectives in 
suggesting this campaign, this campaign that will lead to this attack on New Bern, this attack on Plymouth, and some other operations. And if so if I was going to, we we're going to have a quiz at the end of this, and we're not going to have a quiz. <laughs> um, but if we were going to have a quiz, this would be on the quiz. Uh, and you know, so what, what is Lee trying to do? So one, Lee, I talked a little bit about supply. He is obsessed with supply for good reason in late 1863 into 1864. He's deeply concerned about feeding and equipping his men. Um, the winter had really seen a crisis in his army. His men lacked nearly everything, ammunition, provisions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and for him, North Carolina offered opportunity to help remedy the problem by capturing the federal supply. Not only the federal supply stored at these garrisons, but these U.S. garrisons, but also opening up the the countryside around these so that um, supplies could be brought up north into Virginia. So that's one thing, supply. So for the quiz, if you just say supply, <laughs> you'll get full credit. The second thing is this is a political thing. Because supply was not the only concern for him, for Lee, and Confederate officials. Um, there was the opposition from North Carolina Unionists was really beginning to grow. And beginning in 1863, there was kind of this burgeoning peace movement that gained momentum under the formal, informal leadership of William Holden, who was a newspaper editor in Raleigh. And, uh, and the, this, this peace movement was kind of, an, it was a serious threat to the Confederacy. Well, the serious threat to Confederate North Carolina, but also a serious threat to the Confederacy. But the, so, you know, if North Carolina comes out of the war, what happens to Virginia? You know, there are all these, you know, scenarios you can think of. Um, these peace advocates, you know, their goals though were kind of vague and, uh, and you know, their efforts were very loosely organized, but it was a building force. And, um, and as you go to 1864, there's a um, Governor Vance, the Confederate governor, is up for re-election that summer. And um, Holden emerges as kind of the viable opponent to, um, to Vance. So in addition to the supply problem, you have this <coughs> political problem boiling for the Confederates, boiling in North Carolina. And, Lee understood this, and so when he writes orders for this campaign, um, he throws in a line. He says, the, you know, a successful operation would have the happiest effect in North Carolina and inspire the people. And so when Lee says that in his order, no one at the time is confused about what he means because, um, because they understand what's going on. Um, okay, so that's, the, that's what's going to be on the quiz. That's the important thing as we're going into this. Um, very, very quick um, sidebar here, okay? So while Lee is talking to Davis about this campaign to go um, after the, these um, federal bases in North Carolina, Henry Halleck is kind of organizing stuff up in Washington. He writes Grant. Grant is down in Chattanooga at the time. And he says, hey, you know, um, he doesn't really say this, but he's kind of like, hey, we're brainstorming for the spring campaign. Got any ideas? Love to hear them. And so, so Grant, Grant, will, Grant writes back, and Grant, you know, his, his stuff is so compact and direct, and, and he says, you know, I would, and he doesn't say this exactly, but he says, you know, I would take 60,000 men, I'd get them to Suffolk in Virginia, and I'd drive into North Carolina, I'd break up the railroad, I'd go into Raleigh, I'd resupply at New Bern, and I'd take Wilmington. We'll just do it, okay? <laughs> and um, and Halleck, and Grant, you know, he's he's not in the Eastern Theater at this point. And Halleck writes back, and and, and it's very confusing, Halleck's response, and he, he's kind of misunderstanding what Grant's doing and stuff, but the, the uh, he basically rejects it, and leaves, you know, one of my favorite quotes, he says, he, he thinks it's too piecemeal, he wants to kind of concentrate, and, and Halleck tells Grant, we, we've been too busy cutting the toenails of our enemies. You know, we, uh, so so what, what really that means, that little sidebar, it means that the initiative in the beginning of 1864 goes to the Confederates. Um, so they, you know, Lee's got this plan, um, 
you know, they're planning to go against New Bern. You've got the ironclads, they're still ironclad incubating um, here and on the Roanoke River. Uh, and so Lee and Davis think that this might be, you know, something to use. It turns out at this time in January, as they're planning the, the first, first stage of this campaign, that those ironclads are not ready yet. So they get, um, they get the Jefferson Davis nephew, John Taylor Wood, a very capable officer to organize kind of a, a party of Marines and small boats to go on this expedition. Um, one little thing I can't help but um, to mention here is that the, the, when you look at the correspondence between Lee and Davis at the time, it's really bizarre because Davis, Davis says like, well, who's gonna command this this expedition down to New Bern. And, um, and, and Davis says something like, you know, if I could get a couple days off, I'd go down and command it myself. <laughs> and, and, this is, and you know, when I was working on this project, you know, like you kind of, the more projects you do, the more you see. And I don't think I really appreciated what Davis's, his penchant for really micromanaging things and wanting to get into the weeds. And he says this, and he goes, well, you know, I can't make it down, maybe you should go down, you know, he said, tells Lee to go down. And it's just, to me, it's, it's kind of a bizarre exchange there. But anyway, what happens is that the, the expedition to New Bern um, goes to George Pickett, um, who's uh, after Gettysburg, he is in command of this department that's basically the Confederate Department covering Southern Virginia and North Carolina, and Pickett goes along and he, uh, along with him, he has a very talented young North Carolina general named Robert Hoke. And Robert Hoke is very involved in the planning and the thinking um, for this expedition. And they go down with about 13,000 men against New Bern. Um, New Bern is a very tough nut to crack and we are not gonna, I'm gonna restrain myself and not get into the details of what I think is a very fascinating operation that uh, hasn't been written about a lot, but there are no less than five prongs, five columns. One of them is the Marines and the boats. One of them is a column coming from um, from Wilmington uh, <coughs> that comes up and attacks Newport Barracks. There are all these dramatic things that happen. Hope breaks the outer kind of line, the blockhouse line up, up there and here. Um, Basher Creek, and then there's this bizarre situation that the Federals have um, this this monitor train has a has a gun on it, and it's racing back into the New Bern garrison. And Hoke is has broken through, and he gets he gets to this little intersection like five minutes after the train rolls in. And his plan was to stop the train, get his men on board, and just go right into the middle of New Bern. Doesn't happen, but very interesting. Another thing is Woods, um, Woods' efforts in the middle of the night, he manages to capture um, the underwriter, which is kind of the largest uh, uh, Union gunboat there at the time. He ultimately can't hold it. Um, so there are lots of like, almost, you know, happens kind of thing, and I promise I would not spend a lot of time <laughs> on it. Um, so anyway, it's a failure, and uh, Hope, it is, uh, he, he uh, confesses to uh, one of his friends, um, he says, too bad, too bad, the place is ours, if only I could make General Pickett believe it, but it does no good, no good, he won't listen to me. So there's a lot of kind of criticism of Pickett. Pickett, let's just say Pickett doesn't really shine a lot the rest of the war, uh, and uh, this is you know, just one more example of where things don't go so well for him. Um, so, so this is the first stage, New Bern, this big expedition that we're not going to talk a lot about. Um, but it's a failure, and, um, and, and New Bern, it, there's a lot of celebration. This, this is New Bern. This appears in Leslie's Illustrated, which was a very popular um, newspaper in the North at the time. I think it was on the cover. And these are black recruits in New Bern marching and celebrating the victory and it shows up on the, uh, on the front page of that. Now, now the, so, so you've got that, 
you've got New Bern, and then you've got the next little event that I'm sure everyone's heard in here about the Kinston hangings, and that's all part of the story. I will not go into a lot of detail about, about that, but during the New Bern expedition, as the, um, the Confederates captured a small outpost at a place called Beach Grove, and the prisoners um, turned out to be, the prisoners, you know, federal soldiers, were turned out to be men from North Carolina. These are white men from North Carolina who had enlisted in the Union Army. And these, these, um, these units, North Carolina, the, the, the uh, white North Carolina units were often referred to as buffaloes, which um, I think has kind of murky, I, I'm not sure anyone really knows why they were called buffaloes, but I think they're different theories. Um, and, the, uh, and so these men, as they're being taken back to Kingston, it turns out that a bunch of them were in uh, Confederate units. And so there's a tribunal uh, directed by Pickett uh, and uh, are, are kind of ordered by Pickett. And then the, uh, it ends up over 20 are executed. And this is a, it's an interesting, um, interesting event because, you know, it's tragic. A lot, a lot of these men that were executed were local men. They weren't, uh, and the, I think the people locally felt like maybe this wasn't a great thing to do because there's evidence that maybe some of them were coerced into joining the Union units, or at least that's what people thought at the time. And, uh, and my takeaway, uh, is uh, of this kind of you know talk about in the book is that you know th and there are also lots of legal issues and nobody wants the lawyers to get involved. <laughs> but the, uh, but there, you know there are questions about whether some of these men were in units that were not formally Confederate units, so maybe the tribunal didn't have jurisdiction over them. Blah blah blah. But to me, it just seemed like if the whole point is to kind of boost morale, you know, and get the you got this whole political issue. The whole point of the of the uh, one of the points of the expedition here, of the campaign, is to boost morale. Maybe this was not a very good decision on his part. But anyway, that's the Kinston hanging. And then you've also got you've got the the political issue. And I talked a little bit about this. So as after New Bern, while these these things happening in Kinston, this is in February, right during the month of February, the um, the election, the kind of the campaign kicked off. And you've got Vance and um, Holden. And you know, Vance, you know, is a really interesting figure. Um, you know, he's a big guy, and you know, he's got this doesn't really show it, but he's got fabulous hair. Like every photo of him is just this huge tuft of black hair. And uh, and he had for for a long time his reputation was someone who was constantly um, chirping the Confederate government in Richmond and complaining about, you know, the things the Confederate government was doing with uh, individual rights and all kinds of things like that. Um, Vance was certainly certainly did complain a lot, but he was he was a staunch supporter of the kind of Confederate project. After the war, um, he he wrote that you know his, his real aim was to make sure that slavery stayed intact during the war. And so I think that like his many disagreements with the Confederate government were really more about um, really more about kind of tactics as opposed to kind of overall goals. And and one one uh, slogan kind of attributed to him is "Fight the Yankees and fuss with the Confederacy." And I think that's kind of accurate. Well, he, he begins his campaign. He um, and he goes right after the peace movement. Incredibly effective speaker. An incredibly effective campaigner, and he really makes the case that, you know, he says that the only way to obtain continued peace is to fight it out now. And Holden is a pretty anemic candidate, and he doesn't really gain much, um, much ground. And, and and part of it is because of uh, laws passed in Richmond, he can't publish his newspaper and things like that. But generally, he's just not really, you know, he, he doesn't doesn't do very well in campaigns, but this is all happening at this time. And so, okay, so that's February, uh, and we go into March, and then the next stop is Plymouth. So the um, Lee, after the New Bern expedition, he keeps some of his, um, the troops that were brought down from his army, his, um, 
to participate in the New Bern Expedition. He keeps them in, um, in North Carolina and hoping that, you know, there'll be another bite of the apple before the real campaigning begins in Virginia with Grant and the large armies up there. And so they decide, you know, let's go at Plymouth. Um, and why, you know, why Plymouth? Several reasons. One, Plymouth isn't New Bern, um, which you know, didn't go so well the other time. Plymouth also has an ironclad that's pretty much ready upriver from it, so that's important. And also, Plymouth is uh, in an area where a very large fishery in the Almoroff Sound and lots of counties around there that, are, that have a lot of potential supply. And so Plymouth is picked as the target. And, um, and, the, and Pickett, in Richmond, Pickett is told, draw up a plan for Plymouth. Pickett draws up a plan for um, Plymouth. The, uh, you know, the, the folks in Richmond say, thank you very much for your plan. And they give it to Robert Hope. And so Robert Hope commands this, uh, this operation against Plymouth. And Pickett, who's a little myth by it, is just kind of shoved to the side. So Hoke heads to Plymouth, um, and uh, the uh, let's see, he, he has a force of about seven thousand. He's got three brigades. Uh, the garrison there is three thousand, I think, um, and uh, and he also has coordinated with the captain of the Albemarle, which is getting ready upstream, uh, and the captain there is, is James Cook. Um, a very capable officer. And so that's what they're going after. So let's, real quick, here, here are the forts. I just need to put this up because I spent a lot of time preparing this. <laughs> <laughs> and I've and I, I never actually talked about it in a talk before. But anyway, these are from, taken, uh, traced over from uh, drawings that a uh, uh, US officer did in Plymouth. And so they're highly accurate. Um, uh, you know, depictions of the of the fortifications there. This is the big one, Fort Williams, and these are all around there, but okay, I feel better now. Um, <laughs> all right, so the, uh, all right, so, so here, Plymouth is kind of, here are the defenses, the Roanoke River here, the kind of this U shape, the, the town is kind of framed by these two creeks, Welch's and Conaby here. Um, there's a, pretty stout line here, and Fort Wayne is a big fort right there. There are some detached works out here, Fort Bray along the river. Um, and then the interesting thing here is this eastern flank, there's no continuous line here. There, there are a bunch of kind of scattered readouts. And the, so the, the Plymouth defenses are kind of developed on, with two ideas in mind. One is the the U.S. Navy is going to have, you know, the gunboats are going to have control here, and they're going to support the garrison. And also this idea that this really swampy creek here, Conway Creek, is like going to be really hard to get over. That seems to be the assumption. So that's what Hoke is going after. And so Hoke arrives on Sunday, April 17th. This is a slide of the second day. Um, and not a lot happens. He, he shows up, there, it's a bit of a surprise, but not enough of a surprise. So he can't just overrun the defenses. So he kind of has to you know, settle down for, not really a siege, but he needs to get his artillery out. Now he does bring with him um, several very, very large 20-pound uh, Parrot rifle cannon, which are kind of the largest field service um, pieces in the Civil War are one of the largest. Um, and so he he uses those. A lot of what happens at Plymouth for the first couple of days is really kind of an artillery exchange, a lot of shelling of the uh, the, the the lines and, and what have you. The um, on the so not a lot happens on Sunday, Monday, the oops, Monday, the um, the Virginia Brigade, Montgomery Force Virginia Brigade that he has with him, but a regiment of that heads off and tries to capture Fort Gray. It does not go well for the Confederates. This is kind of organized by, there's a young um, cavalry officer named James Deering, who apparently acts as Hoke's kind of chief of staff for the operation. And he's, 
he is all over the place. And you just think, well, maybe they're four James Deerings, or maybe someone's lying in their accounts or whatever. But he kind of goes and organizes things. He kind of he helps organize this attack. It doesn't go well. Later that evening, um, Hope's own brigade, commanded by John Mercer here, they take this outer work here. It's called um, Fort Wessels. Wessels was the name of the, uh, the federal commander. They named this fort after him. It's also called the 85th Readout um, after the New York, uh, 85th New York. Anyway, the, this is a pretty spirited attack, and it is successful, and the Confederates take this position. It provides kind of another firing position for them uh, against Plymouth. But Monday night, you know, second day they're there, they got this fort, but they haven't really done much else. They, there's you know, some demonstrations here, but there's not a lot going on. Um, but everything changes a couple hours later, because that evening and early that morning, the Albemarle shows up, and in a room full of uh, ironclad experts, I'm a little, you know, uh, I, you know, I have to forgive the uh, simplicity here, but um, the uh, so the Albemarle comes. The Albemarle is an interesting vessel. It's uh, it is uh, there. It is right there, almost sinking. Um, so it's it's very much a homemade affair. It's begun, I think I mentioned earlier, in a cornfield, and it was cobbled together over many months and months, and it was um, covered with iron plating. Much of it was cannibalized from the state's abandoned railroad lines, and it was armed with two powerful Brook rifles. There's an example of one uh, a couple feet away there, and, uh, and it had a very shallow draft. The crew was green when it heads down to Plymouth. This is the first time it's doing anything. Everybody's figuring it out. And, and they're also, according to some of the accounts, they're still putting iron plating on the thing as it's coming down the river. And they, they, put, they have a forge on board and they're, still, they're you know, doing stuff. So it's very much kind of a haphazard affair. But it shows up early Tuesday morning in the darkness. There are two main gunboats in Plymouth, um, the Southfield and the Miami. These are very powerful um, craft. The only problem is they're made of wood. So they're not, you know, it's not a, a real uh, great contest for them. This is the, um, this is the federal naval commander there. It's a guy named Charles Flusser, really interesting guy, obsessed with, you know, for years he's been hearing about this, Al the Albemarle, and he's obsessed with it. One of the interesting things about this exchange here is that several days before Hoke attacked, um, the federal naval commander in eastern North Carolina sends another gunboat called the Tacone or Tacony, I'm not sure how to pronounce Ticone. it. What's that? Tacony. Tacony. Sends the Tacony, and a couple days, you know, the Tacony's there for like 12 hours or something, and and it gets sent back, <coughs> and Flusser and Wessels and Plymouth said, oh, no thanks, we don't need it. We don't need the Taconi. And it's just kind of a mystery. And, and we don't need the Taconi, we aren't really sure the Alamore is going to show up anytime soon. There, there is evidence that perhaps this happened because the, the um, commander of the Taconi outranked Flusser, and by being there would be in control of you know, the operations there, and Flusser who had been, this has been his project forever, getting ready for this. He, he uh, you know, he said, no, we're not gonna do this. And so there, it's kind of an interesting issue. Anyway, the Albemarle comes down the river. The, the two federal vessels are kind of either tied together or they're, you know, the accounts kind of differ, but they're kind of in this like U shape next to each other. Um, James Cook, the, the uh, commander, uh, the Albemarle, he just goes right at him. And he has this, you know, this is kind of, this is a heavy vessel. It's got this steel prow. It glances off the Miami here and just plows right into Southfield. And Southfield just goes down right away. And then, and the, uh, the Albemarle actually gets stuck in the Southfield for a little bit and it's getting dragged under. Eventually it kind of bobs up to the surface and then exchanges fire with the Miami. Busser is on the, the deck of the Miami running to the guns and operating, pulling lanyards and stuff. He goes to one of them uh, and and uh, one of his men says, well, that one has a shell in it as opposed to solid shot. 
Um, and he says, it doesn't matter. He pulls it, the thing ricochets off the Albemarle and kills Fluster right there. The Miami realizes that there is nothing really, um, that this isn't gonna end well for them. And so they head down the river and leave Plymouth. The Albemarle takes control over the, um, the, the water in um, Plymouth. And so you've got now to, this whole thing that Plymouth you know, is based upon that the idea of naval control no longer exists. Hoke takes um, Tuesday, he sends uh, Matt Ransom's uh, brigade around to this flank here. Somehow Ransom gets across that swampy creek um, and lines up and attacks early on Wednesday morning with the uh, help of the Albemarle and, and, and breaches these, these kind of scattered uh, works pretty easily. This is kind of the second stage here where he gets into the town. There's actually like street fight, fighting during this uh, action. Plymouth falls um, and, uh, and, the, and it's a Confederate victory. The other brigades are you know, pressing out against the, uh, the works here, but really the damage is done by Ransom's brigade, by getting across Tommy Creek and then getting into Plymouth. So the, so, the, the, so the results here, the most obvious one is that there are lots of supplies here. And so the Confederates, they, they, after they you know, pack their haversacks full of stuff, they start sending that, all the supplies off. There are reports in the papers about trains full of supplies headed up to, uh, to Richmond. And then there's also kind of a darker side to the victory at, um, at Plymouth. And that's the, uh, uh, according to multiple accounts, some of the Confederates um, murdered black soldiers who were in Plymouth. Now, there were not any black units in Plymouth at the time, but there were several um, regiments that used Plymouth uh, as a recruiting station. And so at the time, there were two, 200, 300 um, black recruits in the garrison that participated in the, um, in the battle. And at the end, there were reports um, that the Confederates um, murdered, executed some of them. And this was consistent with things that had happened on other battlefields uh, before and after. Um, the, the, uh, the real scholarship on this uh, was done by William Jordan and Gerald Thomas in an article that appeared in the North Carolina um, Historical uh, Journal in, uh, in the 1990s. But, and I, you know, looking, I felt like their conclusions, which that it's very hard to tell exactly what happened, how many men were killed, but I pretty much agreed with their conclusions. I also found in my research other uh, accounts that um, basically support those conclusions. But so that's the, the capture of Plymouth. And broadly speaking, there's Hoke and Wessels. Um, broadly speaking, the, the results are that Hoke is promoted, um, grants, um, Grant and Butler up in, up in Virginia, they pretty much want to consolidate things in North Carolina, kind of concentrate in New Bern, and then uh, so that they can focus on the upcoming campaign in Virginia. And we will just briefly, after Plymouth, Hope heads down to Washington. He doesn't attack there, he's outside of there um, for a few days. The federal garrison is ordered to leave, regardless of Hoke's presence. And right as they're leaving, a, a fire breaks out in Washington and burns a good um, chunk of the town. One of the interesting things I found in my research, which I'm not sure anyone has seen before, is the, the investigation report for the burning of Washington, um, which was in the federal records. And they interviewed lots of people about you know, what happened there. So, Hope takes Washington, and then he goes back after Newburgh, and we won't talk about this in any detail, but he gets there, he's hoping the Albemarle will come help him. The Albemarle is stopped in an engagement in Bachelors Bay, um, and so does not make it down there. And Hope is, makes it to here, which is much further than Pickett did, and he's about to attack the next day. We're talking early May, and. A lot of people know what's ha happening in Virginia at that time. Wilderness. Right. 
And so as he's sitting there, there's a string of couriers coming in from Kinston saying, um, you you got to withdraw. you got to get your men back up to Virginia. And Hope withdraws. He does try to get bluff the, the, uh, the Federals into surrendering, but they understand what's going on. And there's quite a humorous exchange between them. Um, but he ends up into Virginia, and his men, most of the men that are in the expedition, are um, going to be involved in the Bermuda 100 campaign and then the, the uh, uh, aspects of the Oberland and the Petersburg campaign. And that's the end of this campaign. So we've got New Bern, we've got Plymouth, Washington Falls, um, New Bern again, and, but New Bern doesn't fall, and that's the end of it. But in terms of the, and I, I know I'm violating my rules here, so I'm going <laughs> to wrap up. Um, so the, so the, in the end, though, the capture of Plymouth opens up huge areas, and capture Washington, huge are, areas of supply. There, in the archives, at least I couldn't find any extant records on of supply shipments. And I was hoping like, I'd find a table of like, pork and stuff like that. But I did find in a lot of the newspapers and in some of the more <coughs> published um, accounts that the eastern area of eastern North Carolina that was captured continued to provide supplies for Lee's army through into the fall. So this was a very significant thing for Lee and Lee's army in Virginia. The other thing is that um, Vance in the election in the summer just destroys Holden. Now, whether that was because of these Confederate victories at Plymouth, the victory at Plymouth was all over the newspapers in the South. It was seen as a big deal. This was not a time in the war where there were a lot of Confederate victories. So this was something that was really focused on. And certainly, according to the anecdotal accounts, this campaign really helped the political situation. But whether Holden was you know, lose anyway, that's another question. And then finally, it just kind of, uh, underlines the, the lack of attention, whether rightly or wrongly, that the federal commanders um, gave to Eastern North Carolina. Um, and, uh, and when all of this was happening, Grant and Butler were kind of like, well, we need those men up here anyway. Let's abandon Washington. We probably, and both Grant and Butler say, both of them separately say, well, I've been recommending all along that we shouldn't have men in these separate garrisons like Plymouth and Washington. I could not find any evidence where they actually said that. I think Butler did believe that because his wife, they, they did a tour when he first came into command of Eastern North Carolina, and the reporter interviewed his wife, and his wife said, I don't think any of these positions are worth holding. So possibly it's something that Butler believed. But anyway, so that's the, that's the story there, and I will stop because I'm over time, and I really appreciate your time. Thanks. Yeah. This was already run aground. That there had been some expectations that she could come down the river, get past obstructions, yeah. and cooperate with an attack on Newburn. Of course, there was expectations too that Albemarle would come down. Albemarle was stopped. In your research, do you think if Albemarle hadn't been stopped, if news hadn't been stopped, Hope could have been successful the second time around? I well, I think you know what really stops Hope is the wilderness campaign. But um, given what happened at Plymouth. Sure, it's a possibility, um, but you know, I, I, it's hard to you know do this counterfact. What is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, when you at the beginning, you were saying that you know, the the Union had at least potentially the ability to roll up into Goldsboro and break the road to Wilmington and Weldon. Um, and when Lee and uh, Davis were planning this campaign against New Bern, that you had, you know, they were looking for. Um, morale and for supplies, but did that, to, to attempt to blunt that potentiality enter into their calculations at all? I think, well, this this had been, by the time they do that, I, I don't I don't recall, um, that is a short answer, but by the time that they do this operation, the, the U.S. forces have been there for a long time and haven't, other than some very large raids like Foster's or Potter's raid, they hadn't taken any you know, concerted offensive in order to gain ground permanently. And I, I think you know, one thing that's in, important, that's interesting to me, is the whole issue of cutting railroads and 
and rage against railroads and what kind of impacts they had. And then the recent thing I did on the Richmond, basically lease supply lines to Gettysburg, what generally you see is that if you just burn the railroad or tear it up or even burn a couple <coughs> of bridges, they generally get fixed, you know, very soon, a couple of days sometimes. And so in order to have the kind of impact you're talking about, you really need a permanent position on there. And that's what, um, you know, McClellan was considering. That there's a very an old book written in the 70s by Rowana Reed, I think I'm getting the name right, on combined <laughs> operations. And she goes in a little bit into this uh, this idea that McClellan had of, of getting this kind of permanent cut to the railroad in North Carolina. Yeah. Just in case there may be somebody who doesn't know, you want to say something very briefly about what happened to the Albemarle? Oh, sure. Um, so the, uh, so the, and, and I, I should have mentioned the noose, but I'm glad you asked. And I'll cover, let's cover both of those. So, so the noose is, the noose finally, they're, they're hoping the noose will come down to New Bern, but then it runs aground, and so it doesn't get involved. Um, the Albemarle. With a pilot from New Bern, by the way. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, all right. So, and so the Albemarle goes, it, it comes out to, it, it refits in Plymouth after the combat. It has a short um, little trip to the Alligator River, and then it comes back, and then it heads down to come and join Polk at New Bern. And the entire um, squadron, uh, Bob, help me out, um, and that comes out and intercepts the, uh, the Albemarle. And so it's kind of this really interesting engagement. It's like eight vessels to one, one and a half. Um, and uh, the Albemarle kind of holds its own, but it, it's, uh, its stack gets a couple shells in it, and uh, it can't draw losing power, so it heads back to uh, Plymouth. And it stays there for the rest of the war until the, um, the Federals, Federals recapture um, Plymouth, but before then there's this daring uh, escapade. And I think maybe that we'll talk about it tomorrow, right? Yes, yeah, so our final presentation yeah, tomorrow so will deal with it. that. I'm going to keep that powder dry. <laughs> There's a nice exhibit in the museum about Cushing and the Cushing torpedo in the rain. Yeah. And all the war. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, if I can add a little bit, I've done, I've done a little work on this too, and, and an interesting uh, sidelight to that is that in the fall of 61, when the Union Navy took Port Royal, uh, Davis sent Lee down there then because they were worried about, about the coast. And Lee told Davis that he was very concerned that the, the Union from Port Royal would go inland from Port Royal, cut the railroad between Charleston and Savannah, and then attack both Charleston and Savannah by land by going around by the railroad in from the sea and take them both. And so he was worried about that very sort of thing, even in the, in, in the fall of 61. Mm -hmm. and, and if Burnside had been allowed, he could have, could have done sort of the same sort of thing. He could have, he could have cut the railroads too. So that, that mm -hmm. was an issue uh, for a long time. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. S.R. Fowle was a merchant in Washington prior to the war. And I believe it was his daughter that published him memoir in the late 19th century in which she describes her activities trying to save her father's warehouse and documents what the Federals had been doing in sabotaging the effort by, by burning, intentionally burning the town basically. Mm -hmm. And she specifically says in this paper about the Yankee soldiers chopping the hoses the fire, from the fire company so it could not be used to put the fires out and fires were started in multiple locations. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that document? I, I don't think I've seen that one. The, uh, but the, the Board of Inquiry does, they, they have certainly witnesses saying that, that the, okay. the, a, a lot of the Union troops were drunk, were leaving, and there are also reports that they, they, their accounts that they were, in, they intentionally set fire to other things. There are other witnesses, including civilians in the town, who said that there were Confederate agents or Confederate um, you know, operatives or whatever that were 
that set these fires in order to kind of make it look like the um, Union troops had burned it down. I don't know what the answer is. Okay. Well, no um, one, no one knows. No one knows. Yeah, but that's what but this, says. but it, but the, uh, but the detail, you know, they, and there are also other stories I won't get into. There was there was a, uh, one of the uh, gunboat commanders was considered kind of this miscreant, and everybody, the Union, union commander, and. Uh, uh, everybody kind of stayed away from him, and he was walking around saying, I'm going to burn the town. So that's another thing. Yes? Let me make a suggestion. Can everybody tell us your name and where you're from? I'm just curious of how many different areas we have represented. Don't let everybody speak. Well, yeah. Right. Well, you, you start. You start. Right. My name is you Mike start, Parker. Mike. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Mike Parker, I live here in Kempston. I'm also on the Friends of the CSS Nation Museum Board. It's my wife, Sandra. She lives with me here in Kempston. <laughs> Why don't we just Very do it this way? Everyone who's from Kempston, raise your hand. Okay. Everyone who's, um, and, and that's one category. Anyone who's within a hundred miles of here, North Carolina? Yeah. 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 We're on the coast. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, get your Google Mouth of Cape Fear. Um, all right, and then who's from out of state? Virginia. Okay, Virginia. All right, and Gaithersburg. Down south. Okay. Great. Great. Anybody else? And feel free to come up and talk to me afterwards. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you.